Welcome back to Through the Ringer. I'm your host, Tate Frazier. We got a fun show. We got Rob Mahoney joining us later to talk about the NBA. But first and foremost, we got the great cousin Sal back. And we are not in the same building, as you can tell. But we are still there in spirit together. Sal, good to see you, man. Great to see you, man. I'm sorry if I don't come at you with the regular <laughs> vigor and, and energy. I was up all night watching the uh, election result. I, I just love both candidates. So I just I, I enjoy the numbers coming in and everything. So anyway, might be a little tired. but Yeah, we're all a little worn out. Uh, but I like what you said. You know, we're all Americans. We're all pulling for both sides. Uh, but let's uh, talk about a lot of things that are happening outside of that. We got a lot of sports to get to. And we got to get there first with the first Tate. And uh, I got some takes for you. We had a fun NFL weekend, Sal. As you know, you were locked in watching all this stuff. And I start there and I say to you, Drake May, who had his heroic moment versus Jaden Daniels, is the real QB rivalry in the 2024 uh, NFL draft class. Obviously, we know about Caleb and we know about Jaden. That's been what we've been, you know, you sent down our, you know, our, our throats for the most part. Uh-huh. This is what it's going to be. But Drake May had his magic. We've seen Jaden Daniels with the Hail Mary. So I say, Sal, in the future, these are going to be the two guys that we're talking about as the rivalry. What, do, what are your thoughts about that? You might be right. Caleb may have lost the locker room. Well, I don't know if it's Aberflus and in Chicago, he's got uh, wide receivers giving up on plays. He's got him, uh, you know, shoulder checking him off, walking off as an injury. But I do like the idea of Daniels against May. It could be Hail Mary versus Hail Mary every week. Mm. You know, you don't count that as a Hail Mary for Drake May because it was like seven yards to tie it up against <laughs> the Titans. But it is. So let, let it be that. Just Hail Mary against Hail Mary, Daniels, and May every week. It's not about, yeah, how long the Hail Mary is. Right. It's about the feeling and it's about the action itself. And both these guys had some heroics and uh, they're fun to watch. And it's I'm excited to see it. It's about the feeling and the action. You, freaking, right. you nailed it, Tate. I yeah, love it. it's the feeling and the action. We all know that. Uh, but the quarterbacks is what we always talk about. And of course, we got to talk about them first. But now I want to talk about the running backs because last year, Sal, we remember there were some conversations about them unionizing, about how the disrespect of the position had gone too far. And now two of the best players and the two most talked about players in the game happen to be running running back. So I say to you, Sal, the renaissance of the running back position is officially on. We got Derrick Henry. We got Saquon Barkley. And if you look at the stats here, I mean, these guys have the exact same amount of touches this season, 177 yards, uh, you know, 10 yards or more plays. Saquon's got the uh, edge there with 29 of those. Uh, Henry's got 25, 20 plus yard plays. Derrick Henry's got 14 of those. Saquon's got 10. So they've been explosive all season long. They've been the stars of their teams. Obviously, you know, Lamar's in the MVP conversation Mm -hmm. that happens with quarterbacks but just in general the running backs are back Sal and that's good for everybody I think it is and I made a case on against all odds yesterday for Saquon at plus 250 to win offensive player of the year because you know a running back or receiver always gets that because they give the MVP to the quarterback he has Crazy. one fewer game if you look at those stats Tate one fewer game than Henry Henry's got a lot more touchdowns but they both average around six yards a carry and yes I mean I laughed when people suggested my Cowboys go out and get a free agent running back I said we have Rico Dowdle we have Ezekiel Elliott why would we want anything like that but uh yeah I nailed that one but yeah Barkley and Henry are look they 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 were picked up to bring their team late into January and I think that might just work yeah, Henry might be the actual what you know the Ravens have needed this entire time in the playoffs. We'll see once we get there. Last first tape for you, Sal. The Chargers are built to win in the playoffs for the first time in franchise history. Famously, you know, Schottenheimer, Marty Schottenheimer would get this team, you know, offensively, you know, the LT era, they were incredible to watch, but then we'd get there in the playoffs and for whatever reason, a lot of, you know, tough breaks for them, obviously in the playoffs, but it would just never work out. And I think this Jim Harbaugh version where they have the number one scoring defense, they kind of just fill in the gaps as they should. They're very fundamentally sound. They can run the football. They can win ugly, which is the opposite of what the Chargers have been able to right. do in the past. I feel like they're actually built to win in the playoffs and that's getting me worried Sal but that's how I feel as I watch this team well this isn't I mean you don't go but you're you're a fetus at this point but uh, (laughs) Eric Coriel and Dan Fouts and Kellen Winslow in the early 80s that team was like a game away from making the Super Bowl a couple times I believe but yeah you're right Uh, I can't believe how rich you're going to get off these season tickets for the Chargers they're going to (laughs) be over 500 got flexed into Sunday night football Sal can't wait Sunday night football we talked about them last week at minus 150 to make the playoffs I said that might be a deal and now it's minus 310 after what they do they beat the Browns but yeah they look good they're pretty balanced there it's a far cry from the team where they had the doctor of the team try to kill the quarterback those days are (laughs) over I think Harbaugh's got everybody in check 
And I could see the Chargers being a team that could upset a team like Baltimore or Houston in the first round of the playoffs. So take a look. Uh, again, make money on those tickets. My God, I'm so jealous. It, yeah, it might be boring, but it, it does work. The results are there. And like you said, they did just beat the Browns, but the Browns were coming off a very motivational win. They beat the Ravens. Jameis Winston was the talk of the town, and it was gone very quickly as soon as that Chargers defense came to town. So now, Sal, it's our time, and it's a great time because we get to play my favorite game, over mm. under reactions. Are you fired up? I can't believe we're, we're past the midway point of the season. Can you believe this? I am. I can't. Is that an over or under reaction? <laughs> oh, no, it's, it's exactly right. Yes, we're past the. Oh, that's not the first one. Okay. No, that's ahead. the proper reaction to what's <laughs> happening here. Let's start here with Pat Mahomes. And I say to you, Sal, Pat Mahomes will never lose an overtime game in his career. He is six and zero so far, and he seems to win the head. You know, the heads or tails, the coin toss every single time that he does this. Over or under reaction. Do you think he'll ever lose a game? I don't think he will. I think it's an underreaction, and that, that doesn't just seem they've won like eight. They've won eight coin tosses in a row. I don't think he's ever going to lose a coin toss in a row, let alone uh, overtime. But I really feel like he's just playing with us. The game has become so boring for Patrick Mahomes and this dynasty. He's like, all right, let's see what happens in overtime. I know we're going to win the coin toss, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> and then he's got you dead to rights. As soon as they have that first possession in OT, it's basically he brings his 300-pound assistant out. And uh, he's a magician, and he carves, he cuts Baker Mayfield in half so everybody could see it. I know that's getting very visual. You don't want to see it. But <laughs> the longer the short of it is, yeah, Mahomes is never losing an overtime game. He's never going to lose a coin toss. He's never going to lose an overtime game. And uh, officially, let's start the investigation soon, Sal. Uh, next up, we say the Lions proved all the doubters wrong by winning a game outdoors. They finally did it, Sal. Over or under reaction, your thoughts on the Lions? Yeah, I mean, this is not a kick line squad from Fort Lauderdale, right? This is a professional football team. They've <laughs> beat, they've proven the doubters wrong. The doubters said they couldn't win in cold weather. And, like, it's kind of dumb. They have, like, Sam Laporta from Iowa. They have uh, Montgomery, I believe, is from Iowa State. Penny Sewell from Oregon, right? These guys are cold weather players you know they're not they're not getting their college reps in the tropics and they have a tough ass coach and dan campbell you don't have to bleep ass come on come on this, who's watching <laughs> don't do this? it who's watching this the, <laughs> the, the, the royalty and in, in uh in luxembourg I, I don't know but anyway there you go uh that's my that's my take on this I like it. And, uh, you know, Dan Campbell seems like a guy that likes to play outdoors and likes to be in those kind of mm -hmm. environments. It is funny. We talk about the Lions as if they're the Miami Dolphins. They are very different. Yeah. And uh, we'll get to that in a little bit here. Next up, Sal, I say to you, Mike Tyson will get a win in AT&T Stadium before Mike McCarthy. I know that was a little bit sour there. Over or under reaction. What are your thoughts on this? That is so rude. They, <laughs> it is very like rude. Maybe the I didn't write this. I, I, I don't know what happened to you. I mean, to put that out there. And it's so accurate. And by the way, I don't even know that Mike Tyson is going going to beat Jake Paul next week in AT&T Stadium. But I still would say this is an underreaction because he could set up a fight with Evander Holyfield in 2033 when he's 72 years old mm. and still get a win before Mike McCarthy in AT&T Stadium. I'm not happy with this Cowboys team, Tate. I'm not happy for you. It's very tough times, but uh, Jerry will come in there and save the day. Uh, I say to you, Sal, Derek Carr will get Dennis Allen fired for a third time. It does feel like history repeats itself every decade. He gets him fired. So we, uh, you know, by all accounts, we have a chance for this to happen again. Is that an over or under reaction? I'm going to say overreaction slightly because I don't think it's going to happen in football. It's going to be hard to get him fired three times in football, <laughs> but he could get fired another way at the hands of Derek Carr. Like if Derek Carr pulls up to a drive through at Burger King and Dennis Allen serves him like a vanilla shake and he pours it accidentally all over Derek Carr and it gets in his eyeliner and mm. stuff. Like I could see that being a, and then he complains <laughs> Derek Carr and gets him fired from that job. I think that, yes, let's go over two and a half firings. I think he does get it done again. I think it happens again. It, it could be in the TV booth for all we know, but I think it will right. happen. Derek Carr obviously has a vendetta and he will get it done. Crazy to think about where this team was after week two in the locker room in Dallas to where they are now. And Mike McCarthy is oh. still the head coach of the Cowboys, uh, which is crazy to think about next up Sal Speaking the Dolphins shakes yeah <laughs> give him another one uh, the Dolphins are having a quote unquote season from hell this is what John Jastrzemski of course <laughs> uh, labeled this for the Miami Dolphins is that an over or under reaction Sal well listen they, of course they, yes they are having a season from hell although they still have their quarterback right they still have their quarterback from the, of the future uh Cowboys you can make a case Cooper Rush is in right now we don't know the extent of this injury it's probably just an ankle whatever uh hamstring but I would say Cowboys, um, Dolphins, Jaguars, Jets are the candidates for, you know, year from hell. I'm not going to count like your team or the Patriots who weren't expected to light it up 
just yet. But, you know, then again, Cooper Rush and Jonathan Mingo could, you know, light us up and get us to 5-12, and 12 and I'll have a, I'll have a different take on things. Well, the good news is, is, as well as the Miami Dolphins, JJ's team, New York, New York, both those teams are having seasons from hell. So he gets right. to cover. It's like the, the Bermuda Triangle of seasons from hell between the Dolphins, the New York Jets, and the New York Giants. Bro, so you JJ's have no in. idea, bro, how it's affecting my <laughs> golf swing. <laughs> He's going to get his grip fixed, Sal. You just you just wait. Uh, speaking of the Giants, I say to you, the Giants should trade for Bryce Young before their game in Germany. This was the game we circled at the beginning of the season as the worst game of the season. It yeah. is living up to the hype, Sal. Uh, over or under reaction, should they make this move? We did circle this, right, as the loser was going to have the fewest wins. Stay in, in Germany, It might right? be different because there's like six teams with two wins or something. But this would be good and interesting. An overseas trade, they should – I mean, I, I don't know, Bryce Young. They should trade for Vince Young right now. <laughs> uh, if I'm the Giants, I, I shake it up. What do you do? How say you, Tate? You're a Panthers fan. Do you go – I don't know. Do you go like uh, Daniel Jones and 15 Bratwurst for Bryce Young at this point? No, we're going to keep Bryce Young. He was very happy. He got his win. You know what I mean? You could, you kind of just see the growth from week one. Struggled against the Saints. You know, by this time of the season, he seems like he gets it. So, Bryce I Young, see a growth you're like Carolina that, Panther. And I go right to the doctor. I don't know. I'm not sure that's a growth <laughs> well, you want to see. Well, you're a wiser man than me, Sal, so you probably know what to do in those situations. Uh, let's talk about the NFC West. I say to you, two or more NFC West teams will make the playoffs this season over or under reaction. All right, I'm, I'm sure I'm contradicting my answer when we <laughs> went over something similar a couple weeks ago with this NFC West because I loved it. But now I kind of think it's going to be one. I think it's going to be just a division winner in the NFC West because now Washington's going to get to 10 wins. They have seven already, right? The Vikings are going to make the playoffs. Of course, the Lions are. I'm counting the Eagles in the East as the winner. Uh, one team from the South. So that leaves either the Packers or Seattle, Rams, 49ers, whoever, whoever doesn't win that division. Um, Green Bay minus 205 to make the playoffs. You have to think they play against San Francisco and at Seattle. If they take one of those two, I think they're going to get to 10 wins and they're going to steal that seventh seed. So there you have it. The NFC West, we said, was the most fun last week. And we were talking maybe three teams. Now we're talking one It'll team. Be fun. I think they'll still <laughs> battle for like nine and eight at the end of the season. It'll still be yeah. fun. It's good for the NFL. That's what we yeah. want. Uh, let's talk about Tua. I say to you, Sal, Tua over 243 and a half passing yards is the worst bet ache of the season so far over or under reaction. Disgusting. Can we show this play? <laughs> I yeah, mean, this please. is really something else. So he was at 254, right, with five seconds left. Feel pretty comfortable about that, right? If you're 11 yards past what you, the expectation and five seconds left, well, no. He throws, it's lateral, it's lateral, it's not even thrown to Waddle, and Waddle, they lose like 13, 14 yards, whatever it is, and that is a miserable, miserable bed ache if I've ever heard one, and I think FanDuel should offer what I'm calling final play insurance, FPI. Okay. You know what? They have Flo from Progressive out there doing her stuff. Just have Flo be a FanDuel spokesperson instead of uh, minus 110. It's minus 112, and you can't lose on the final play of the game, unless it's a field goal or something like that. But this lateral crap, this kneel-down crap doesn't count. I like it. You know, you ask someone, did you get FBI and uh, or yeah. FPI? And then, you know, they're like, what do you mean? And you call a hotline, it's the FPI instead of the FBI, and you let them know. Right. This, oh, you know, yeah. Neil Dame, Neil Down or whatever it was, was a problem. So this would be good stuff. I like where your head's at. Innovative, to say the least. Let's talk about LeBron James. Sal, LeBron will stop meddling in the Lakers front office business now that they did his bidding and drafted Bronny James onto the team. Is that an over or under reaction? Your thoughts? Yeah, I heard Simmons and Kirk Goldsberry talking about how he's going to be on his best behavior because his son's right there. And I, I don't know. I thought Simmons grew up in the 80s like I did when you would go to your friend's house and the father would routinely smack him around right in front of you. It didn't matter. I mean, that's how it was. I think that's kind of how, where we will be. And by the way, Ronnie's going to be sent off to the G League, right? Any, any day now in like four minutes. And so LeBron will be back to his meddling ways, I'm sure. So. I wouldn't get too crazy about that. Yeah, as soon as Bronny goes to the G League, goes to the yeah. South Bay Lakers, I feel like I, I feel for everyone in the building because the wrath <laughs> has been building. That's right. And uh, I think he will let him know how he feels. Let's uh, call up the Riverboat Captain. Let's do some prop culture. And let's uh, get the question of the week, Sal. Based on the Joel and B conflict, in case you missed it, he had a little altercation with a media member after he had written some things, some unseemly things about his family members. Uh, here is what we're asking, Sal. Which is the best reporter sports personality altercation 
equivocation of all time. Let's run through the odds here. Jim Rome, Jim Everett, it's favorite at three to one. Tim McCarver, Deion Sanders at seven to one. Larry Merchant, Floyd Mayweather at twenty to one. Bob Costas and Vince McMahon at thirty to one. And we got the field at even odds. What say you, Sal? Which is the best one? What's the best altercation that we've seen? These are great choices here because it's been a, a lot. few of yeah. them have the threat of physical violence and then the one <laughs> at the top has the actual physical violence mm. and I think everyone would agree Jim Rome uh, deserved that from Jim, Jim Everett at the time. Mm. McCarver, Deion Sanders threw water on McCarver with champagne. It was something. It was something crazy. Uh, not in a flattering way. Larry Merchant and Floyd Mayweather went at it. Casas, uh, McMahon got in Casas. It's all good. I'll tell you what. I'm going to take you back, Tate. And I wasn't even around for this, but Muhammad Ali and Howard Cosell had the best athlete um, interviewer relationship, I would say I'd ever come across. Uh, if you look at the clips online, it was like a friendly, hostile environment between those two. Why are you looking down? What's going on with you? What happened? No, I'm oh, I'm, I'm oh. listening. I'm listening. Who are you texting right now? <laughs> I'm, I'm pouring my heart out about Muhammad Ali. I'm yeah. listening. Uh, it was playful animosity. Ali would rhyme and he would dance and he would shadow box with Cosell and he would even try to grab at his wig. It was the greatest thing in the world. Look it up on YouTube. Muhammad Ali, Wig, Howard Cosell. That's what I would uh, pick right there. Yeah, put that in your Google searches right now. Go watch that. That's an epic <laughs> moment. The reason I was looking down because I wanted to yeah. get this Jim Calhoun thing correct, and oh. that is my pick. I'm going to go with the field and even odds. Jim Calhoun famously uh, got in a little back and forth with a reporter. Uh, right. This is back in 2009, and he you know, was asked about his salary. There was a budget deficit in the state of Connecticut, and he was asked about his uh, big salary, and yeah. uh, he famously said, not a dime back, uh, and he repeated it multiple times, not a dime back. Uh, that is how he felt about his salary. So, you know, I love it. a lot of great altercations all right. here. Next time, um, do your research before the show, will you? Okay. <laughs> I'll do my best, all right? <laughs> uh, but two great moments, and uh, obviously some great odds there but yeah the the favorite the Jim Everett Jim Rome moment is something we all have kind of Tremendous. seared in our memories forever one of the best uh, we're going to take a quick break when we come back with Cousin Sal we're going to do some line look aheads and subtract to the futures Welcome back to Through the Ringer. We're here with Cousin Sal, and we now have some fun. We're going to look ahead to Thursday night football. Uh, getting a little bit better, Sal, as we watch these Thursday night football games. And we got a good mm. matchup this week. AFC North showdown here. We got the Cincinnati uh, Cincinnati Bengals taking on the Baltimore Ravens. And this game is uh, right now Baltimore minus six and a half. The total 52 and a half. Who do you like in this one, Sal? And uh, a nice divisional matchup on Thursday Night Football should be it's fun. It's a fun one. I'm looking forward to this. It was 41-38, I think, last time they played in overtime. Baltimore won in Cincinnati. When I picked the line with Simmons, I thought this was a little high. I had it at 5.5. It's already at 6.5. I guess Cincinnati's not to be trusted. But like I said, they played a month ago. There was 79 points scored. The quarterbacks combined for nine touchdowns and one interception. The Bengals... Um, have lost three in a row to the Ravens, and I don't expect either defense to show up. Uh, the last three have been in the 50s and 70 points, so I would say high-scoring affair. I'm not sure which way I'm leaning for the side. Yeah, and I will say the Ravens' defense, passing defense in particular, has been terrible. They're the worst in the NFL, and if there was ever a game for Joe Burrow to kind of send a message in the passing game into the rest of the league to say, hey, Cincinnati's still hanging around, this may be the game to do it. Uh, let's look at some player props. You like Henry, right, Sal, over, uh, right, in rushing yards? I do. How did, how did you know I don't, I don't, I just, In my mind, what? I just saw that. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> 90 and a half. It went from 87 and a half already. We're not even like a, a day before the game. But 90 and a half is minus 114. I'm going over. Bengals 24th in rush defense. They allow a buck 40 on the ground per game. 100 to Barkley and Chuba Hubbard. Henry had 92 on the ground last time they played each other. Mm -hmm. He's hit his over six of the last seven and five of his last six at home. He likes to show off in front of the home crowd. I don't know. It's a real, real weirdo like that. But lots of offense, lots of King Henry go over his player prop total. I like that. Anytime it's a King Henry over, I'm a fan mm -hmm. of it. I'm going to go with Deontay Johnson. Anytime touchdown sound plus 270. I do feel like they want to validate this trade. I do feel like they've been trying to put more and more weapons around Lamar Jackson. And I think in this game, he does get the touchdown to get people fired up. So I'm going to take Deontay Johnson didn't get anything uh, in his first game with the Ravens, but this time around, I think he figures it out. So uh, plus 270. Right. I'm going to take a swing, Sal. Okay. 
Take that swing. I'm going to take like that it. swing. We'll see I what happens. It. Yeah, I don't like it. Yeah, they get him in there. That was a good pickup. And, you know, we, we see with DeAndre Hopkins um, signing, you know, we're going to see these new guys explode, I think. I thought that was going to be the guy that they went for, to be honest. You know, right. Hopkins, Henry, uh, reunion there, former Titans guys playing with each other with the Ravens. I think they put in for him, but they spelled DeAndre wrong, and it ended up being Deontay. <laughs> this is how birth certificates are messed up. I know. It's tough. It's tough with this stuff. It's how it works. Let's track to the future. Let's look at the coach of the year odds in the NFL. We've got midseason awards. Awards are coming out. The Ringers, Shield Kapadia put out his uh, list. He got Mike Tomlin as his pick for Coach of the Year. But if you look at the odds out, Dan Quinn is the favorite, plus 200. Sean Payton, plus 750. Dan Campbell as well at plus 750. And Andy Reid at plus 750. Who do you like for the Coach of the Year? And uh, is now the time to make that bet? Well, it's a bummer because I wish now was the time to make that bet because early in the year, I put $35,000 on Dennis Allen and it doesn't look, <laughs> I don't, that's not promising, right? I mean, you could go somewhere seven. else. You can make a bounce know. back. <laughs> Harbaugh is like seventh at plus 1200, which is surprising. I guess the closer Dan Quinn gets to 10 wins, the less exciting this ward becomes. But right now, if I had a vote, I'd go Dan Quinn and then Dan Campbell. And then Dan O'Connell. I know his name isn't Dan, but it's got to be a third Dan. So no, I would go Coach O'Connell. But it's funny that we don't even mention Andy Reid in there, the uh, the leader of the only undefeated team. Yeah. How many, like, is it one of those things where we're like, with all the title success, you don't even give Andy Reid the credit? Uh, you know what I mean? Like, I don't understand how this works. It does feel like if you were just doing objectively, it's Dan Campbell, Andy Reid would probably be the the top two guys, maybe Dan Quinn's in there as well, as you said, and any other yeah. Dan we could find. Um, but yeah. it is wild that Andy Reid is not even in the conversation. Maybe if his name was Belichick. Dandy Reid. Yeah, Dandy Reid. If he changes it to Dan D. Reid, I think you're right. <laughs> the uh, pro- initial D. Yeah. Maybe but next yeah, they year. they did a Belichick, too. Like he, he went like 12 years between winning the awards. He had the best team. Yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, obviously, there's going to be a lot of conversation about coaches, and now we got coordinators being asked about you know what they would do as a head coach. Ben Johnson getting that conversation, uh, you know, like how he would like to call plays as a head coach. So mm-hmm. a lot of jockeying for position right now. Uh, one last thing as we're talking about coaches in the NFL, just a gut check for you, Sal. Bill Belichick, I talked to Nora about this last week. Bill Belichick, is he coaching next year? Do you think that he's jockeying for position right now? Like, How do you feel about where he stands as far as like trying to angle for one of these jobs? I think, you know, there's going to be seven jobs, right? There's going to be mm-hmm. like five, six, or seven jobs. So even if he thinks no, I feel like he's going to get an offer in there that he likes. And our boss, Bill Simmons, thinks that this is all a ruse. Oh, he's going to show how he has personality, and this is going to win him the job before he even steps uh, you know, to, in to get interviewed because – Apparently, his two interviews with Atlanta weren't <laughs> enough last year. So I do think there's going to be too many opportunities for him to turn them all down. And some people were saying, you know, the girlfriend wearing the Giants uh, kind of gear was a wink, wink. You know what I mean? Like you know, for Halloween. So who knows? Right. I don't know what Bill Belichick is angling for, but he definitely is thinking about football. And I wouldn't be shocked yeah. if he's coaching next year. And we'll see how that goes. Another track to the future. Let's talk about a team that does have a really good head coach, the 49ers. And we're looking at their over under. The line is nine and a half wins um sal what do you think about this over or under uh, if you look at their line you know i've been yapping about san francisco because now they're going to get mccaffrey back after mm-hmm. the buy it looks like and how they're going to be a force when he returns and all this arizona the Rams, seahawks are going to go away all that talk is going to go away and we should jump on plus 105 to win a division for san francisco and then i'm looking especially at nine and a half wins and i'm looking at their schedule at bills at bucks at dolphins at cards at packers they're lucky to get three of those. That's seven wins. Then home against Seattle, Bears, Rams, and Lions. I'll give them another three tape, but that's a rough 10 wins to get there. Uh, don't expect them to run the table by any means. Tough sledding ahead for the 49ers. Yeah, I mean, can Christian, Christian McCaffrey come back to and be the Christian McCaffrey that we've seen where he is the workhorse yeah. of this offense is the bigger question, too. It's not something where you can just slot him right in and say, here's, you know, however many touches a game, go get us these yards, because I, I think that's going to be right. a lot to ask coming off of injury. So uh, 49ers, like you said, it's going to be tough sledding to get to 10 wins, but you still like mm-hmm. the over there. Let's do college football upset specials uh, uh you were on a tear sal um some people were saying you were the college football king we were getting really? close people said that yeah they Who were said that? that a lot of people a lot wow of people okay saw billboards and everything out here <laughs> thanks to our friends at right. Fanduel. um last week the pick game did not go as expected uh but this week you feel better you feel like you're back in the saddle and you feel like you can make magic happen again right No, no. I think we go back to last week. I think I'm going to go on a losing streak now. Okay. But go ahead. Yeah, Pitt plus 220 over SMU was uh, disgraceful. I'm going to go North Texas plus 180 over Army, over undefeated Army. Tate, the mean green. 
North Texas could score. Seven of their last eight have gone over the total. They're allowing almost 40 points a game. So this could be a crazy one. They're 128th in Division I there. But they also have 527 yards of offense a game, third in Division I. Chandler Morris closing in on 3,000 yards. He has 15 TD passes in the last four games. Give me the mean green, plus 180. Yeah, no salute to service from you, Sal. Uh, you're going to take North Texas in an election week. Is that week. anti-American? I, we donated <laughs> leftover candy uh, to yeah. the troops. I well, feel you good. can't spell salute without Sal, so uh, oh, you know, you salute go. to service. <laughs> uh, I like the pick. I think that's a good one there. Plus 180, there's some value. I have not been on a hot streak. I've been on the coldest streak of all cold streaks. I'm going to take LSU at home in a night game against Alabama, plus 122. If you can get LSU at home at night against a, you know, a high-profile team, I feel like they're going to show up for this game game and you get plus money so yeah it'll be a great game van lathan will be watching so lsu plus 122 uh let's see if we can get on a hot streak now so let's see if we can do what we did back in week one when we did this now let's track to the future we got college football we just talked about now let's talk about something near and dear to my heart men's college basketball and we got odds we got futures and we got ncaa championship futures sal the favorite uh right now is duke uh at plus 950 but we got some thoughts and we got some picks and you like the huskies correct uh to do it again a three-peat i'm gonna defer to you because this is your bread and butter but i'm gonna go uconn plus 1100 they were plus 1600 last year uh you know they lose guys they lose Klingon, they lose castle but the year before they lost sonogo and, and hawkins and ja- andrew jackson you know, this is all, this is a bet on Danny Hurley, right? He knows what he's doing. He's great at developing players that fit his system. They got the St. Mary's transfer at Mahaney, uh, um, you know, a Caravan. They have McNeely's going to be good. They have a great shot at a one or two seed. So that's why I think this number at 11 to one is good. They'll be plus 450 if they get to that second round of the tournament, I think. I don't think he's going to go coach the Saints or anything. So give me UConn at plus 1100. You never know. He may go do that. We'll see what happens. Danny <laughs> Hurley, the best coach in the game. And I think that's a great pick. And uh, he actually likes that nobody's picking them, which is even scarier. And right. honestly, no one can even compete with these guys in March, the past two tournaments. So UConn is almost like a safe bet at this point. I'm going to take well, Alabama. You have the winner. Who do you like? Alabama? I yeah. like Alabama as the winner, plus 1100. I think those are the two best coaches in basketball right now. Nate Oates. Dan Hurley. Dan Hurley, obviously number one coming off back-to-back national championships, but both these teams have one word. They have depth. Uh, Both these teams have 11 guys that can really play, um, and they're going to play those guys in November, December, figure out their actual rotation and get to that, you know, nice sweet spot of eight guys when they get ready for the tournament, and they're going to be eight talented guys. And Alabama, I think they got the horses. They got the freshmen. They got the transfers. They got the returnees with Mark Sears coming back, Grant Nelson coming back. So, um, you know, I, I just think Alabama can score 100 points on anybody. They might even break the record that LMU set. They scored really? over 100 points in 28 out of 32 games, Sal. So I think Alabama might be able to do something like that this season. How fun that's would how that have been are. living out here during oh, the LMU days, right? The best. One of those games that have been a lot of fun. It's right. Forget it's it. five minutes happens. away from me. I wish we could yeah. go right now and see it. Uh, let's do some best value to reach the final four. You and I talked about this on One Shining Podcast. Mm-hmm. Appreciate you coming on the show. But uh, you got a, a, someone that you liked, even different than when we talked, uh, not even a few days ago. Yeah, I, but I had Tennessee. I think at the same odds, plus 950 to make the final four. I'm going to go Purdue. Uh, I'll I hit like you with it. Purdue. They beat Corpus Christi. They killed Corpus <laughs> Christi Monday night by 17. What else do you need to see, Tate? Now, um, first of all, I still think Zach Eady's coming back. He's fouling out all over mm-hmm. the place in the NBA. But they have solid juniors, right? Braden Smith in that game against Cor- Corpus Christi had 15 assists, 12 points. Uh, Fletcher Lawyer and Trey, uh, Trey Kaufman Rent Smith is the preseason Big Ten Player of the Year favorite i don't know you know about 40 percent of our against all odds podcast is devoted to whether <laughs> coach painter is a good coach right I don't know which side you are on but i think he's good and good enough to make the final four he's a very good coach i think he's uh you know when i was talking about the top coaches at the game matt painter is right in that conversation as well even though harry doesn't want to hear that so i like right. that pick and uh, they did replace Edie with another seven foot four giant that's right they have a right. freshman uh this kid is from america his name is daniel jacobson and he started in their first game so they're going to be all right with giants i got st john I'm going to take the Johnnies, Rick Pitino. It's a fun run. They have Kadari Richmond, Simeon Wiltshire look good in their first game. He was a former North Carolina commit that ended up switching to the Johnnies. They got a lot of talent, um, and I think they're going to fare well in the Big East playing UConn. They'll see what the best of the best looks like, and I think Rick Pitino is going to get back to one more Final Four. So this could be the year. Plus 950. That's the number for us. And uh, Sal, last thing before I let you go, the Tate debate. 
I say to you, we mentioned Mahomes. Uh, he dominates in overtime and he wins these coin tosses. And it got my wheel spinning because I'm thinking to myself, we got to change this coin toss. So I say to you, Sal, it's time to update the coin toss in the NFL. Last time we did this was around 2008. I think we need a scram- scramble drill. Uh, same thing that we saw in the XFL Ooh. where these guys come out, we roll the ball, first one to the ball, gets the ball to start the second half. You're telling me Baker Mayfield wasn't going to beat Pat Mahomes in a scramble drill? Uh, no chance that Pat Mahomes wins that. And I think Baker Mayfield, he just wanted it more. And, it, and when I saw that in his eyes, the passion, I was right. like, there needs to be a better way than some guy flipping a coin i agree there has to be a better way the scramble drill it's so funny would you have to send the quarterbacks out against you don't have to send the quarterbacks i I think there's a little bit of gamesmanship that goes on but again you don't want to see send some idiot special teams guy out there to make a decision for you you know what i mean he might be spooked by the moment so a lot lot of gamesmanship goes on yeah i you know what i like that but i think they should change it up every week pick out of a hat let's do a reality (laughs) show type thing like one one week it's 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 balancing on crates remember that was like a big thing walking on milk crates and the the cinnamon chat challenge could be something else or maybe just a slap fight you know they do a slap fight mm. Mahomes gets slapped he wins but he has to like take the next snap with his eyeball on the on the other side of his skull I think that would be good let's mix it up yeah like they roll out a ping pong table and it's just you know first point wins yeah. you know what I mean like yeah, a little, little mini nerf hoop yeah right someone's <laughs> got to make the shot first it is very arbitrary to have a coin toss in general so I feel like we could do a lot of things uh we had our producer mentioned before this uh you know doing the wheel of fortune you know you go out there and spin right. the wheel uh and see who gets the football um yeah NFL. coins people don't even use coins anymore right it's, it's dumb it's not a part of uh you know you're not going to use like a, a quill or like a feather and ink right i mean that was from the 1800s so let's it's, move on let's get it's old school on. let's go to the right. new school let's figure it out uh sal you're the best we appreciate you coming to the show where can we find all your work and then we'll let you go enjoy the rest of your day Guess the Lions on Sunday night, uh, Ringer pregame show Sunday morning. We, well, I mean, people see us on this show right now. And then against yeah. all odds tomorrow with the great Tate Frazier helping oh, us yeah. out with college basketball. That's going to be a lot of fun, Sal. We appreciate you coming on the show. And on the other side of the break, we got Rob Mahoney joining the show. Thanks again, Sal. Welcome back to Through the Ringer. Joining us now, it is the Ringer's very own host, or one of the hosts of Group Chat. He is the great Rob Mahoney, and he's going to help us make sense of the NBA. Rob, good to see you, man. Likewise. Look, I'm trying to make sense of it all myself, (laughs) so I'm hoping this could be a collaborative process. Right. We'll do our best to work through this. There's a lot of uh, things that are happening in the sports world, specifically if you're a fan of basketball. We got college basketball, men's and women's. We got NBA basketball firing out of a cannon. There's, you know, a lot of things to keep up with, a lot of games to watch. But we're going to start with the Oklahoma City Thunder, which is kind of the darling of the NBA right now. Everybody's in love with the OKC Thunder. And it starts with the defense of the only team holding every one of their opponents under 100 points so far at least on average um what is it about okc that everyone does love and what is the ceiling of this team this year i think a lot of it's the defense as you mentioned very chaotic time in the basketball world (laughs) the one thing i think you can count on is these guys in particular the oklahoma city thunder are gonna lock everybody up they force more turnovers than anybody they protect the rim better than anybody they hound you off the three-point line and really jam up everything you're even thinking about doing so i kind of get second and secondhand anxiety watching other teams try to work against them sometimes. I can't imagine how it feels to actually play against ball hawks like Alex Caruso and Lou Dort and Kaysen Wall. It's like these guys are all over you all the time. And what's funny about it is that, you know, when we talked about the Warriors, right, and how they impacted the NBA, we never really talked about the defensive side of the Warriors. Yeah. And it does feel like the Oklahoma City Thunder, they have that defense that you really need to make a run. Are we already thinking about parallels between 2012 OKC and like a young team making a run to the finals, or am I getting ahead of myself? No, I think the Thunder themselves are probably looking ahead that far. you got to go through every step to get there. This was a team that was eliminated maybe a little bit earlier than they had hoped last time around. You have to beat all the teams in front of you. But right now, they feel like the presumptive favorite in the West. It's a case where I think we can sort of pencil them in as the potential number one seed, and we're going to see if anybody can catch them along the way. But they have all the goods, right? They have the superstar. They have the defense. They have the depth. They should be able to do it, and now they just have to do it. And let's talk about that superstar, SGA, the favorite right now to win MVP. If you look at FanDuel, plus 250. Uh, They're plus 280 to win the West, uh, plus 480 to make the final. So obviously Vegas is a big fan of OKC. SGA, what does an MVP campaign look like for SGA? Like, what does he have to do? Because he's been first team All-NBA. He's been right there. But what does he have to do to get over the hump? 
I mean, I think it it starts with the Thunder being the best team definitively in the league. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because if if you want to get into a battle of number one seed MVP candidates, for example, if the Celtics are pretty dominant again, Jason Tatum himself might have a really good case. A bit more of a balanced team, a a kind of different ecosystem there. But if Shea can have the sort of individual numbers that he's perfectly capable of putting up, plus the overall team success, plus they're definitively the best team in the West. That's going to be a tough case to beat. And, you know, Luka's going to be in that conversation too. Guys like Tatum or Jalen Brunson, if the Knicks do well, are going to be in that conversation. Nikola Jokic dragging the Nuggets however far he can drag them is going to be in that mix. But I, I don't know how you could look past Shea as one of the defining MVP candidates so far. So let's talk about Luka. Luka's always fun to watch. He got his team yeah. to the finals. Uh, a lot of people were expecting the Mavericks to win that finals, which if you go back, is kind of crazy when you think about the season at large, but that's because of Luka and Kyrie and how incredible they were. What can Luka do to get this team back in that position and also maybe get his first MVP? Yeah, back in that position, I think you would have to think of the Mavs as one of the biggest challengers to the Thunder between Mm -hmm. the fact that they beat them last time around, style of play, Luka's individual brilliance, and the fact that if anyone is going to be better than Shea in a series, it's going to be someone like him. Once his percentages actually come around and he starts making a lot of the shots, in particular in the lane that we're used to seeing him make... Uh, I think everything is going to be just fine for the Mavs. He is always fun to watch. So let's talk about the Suns. The Suns obviously have their one-two punch with Booker and KD. They've been great so far. There's kind of like a top three in the West that, you know, they've all kind of checked the box. They're winning by a lot, and they look like they've figured some things out. What do we like about the Suns and adding, you know, Jones into the mix? Did that really right the ship for everything with this team? I don't know if it righted the ship for everything, because in particular, the starting lineup for as talented as it is still hasn't been very good yet. Those Mm -hmm. guys are kind of figuring out the balance and exactly how to play together. And I think the weirdly enough, the bigs for the Suns are almost a bigger question now than the point guards. They have pulled their turnovers way down, bring in Tyus Jones and Monte Morris. We've even seen some lineups with, you know, Booker and Beal running point. They've just been a little cleaner overall than they were last year. Those guys are a little bit more comfortable in those roles. They got but the over- reps, right? I mean, they, that- <laughs> they certainly do. <laughs> right. But over- overall, I think the team works because the spacing works and the spacing works because Mike Budenholzer, who's, you know, their first, first season as Sunset coach has encouraged some of the best shooters in the world. Perhaps you should take more threes and a uh, revolutionary concept, though, it is for some of these guys. They've done it. The three point usage is way up shockingly the offense is really good and the defense has been there too so i i think they're going to be one of these teams that's there all season long they're always going to live and die with the jumper a little bit but between the versatility and the depth that they have i I see them as a pretty formidable contender and who would have thought looking if we were in 2021 in a time capsule to see coach bud on the sidelines with the suns i mean you know it's crazy how quickly things change and he has this team rolling and obviously milwaukee we'll talk about them a little bit later they wish they had his kind of energy on the sidelines let's talk about la both teams we'll start with the lakers they're obviously the main draw Great start. Um, they they won the headlines. Uh, everything was going swell. But now we got the AD situation. LeBron said he doesn't do if questions and if scenarios. He doesn't want to live in if world. Uh, he must not have gone and see the new Ryan Reynolds movie. Um, your thoughts on, uh, you know, LeBron, AD. Can the Lakers survive if AD's out indefinitely? Maybe not. Mm. Uh, and it, really a state of how the Lakers have changed and how, how much the construction of that team has changed. AD is sort of their baseline now, what he brings on defense, the way they're looking for him on offense for really the first time in years on a consistent basis. And he's he's such a focal point of everything that they're doing. LeBron at his age, it's maybe just not reasonable to expect him to be that on an every night basis against the Detroit Pistons. Like he's just not going to have it in every single matchup of the regular season in the way that AD is still capable of doing. So, yeah, it's an incredibly tough blow for him and for them. Like, they they just don't have the overall supporting cast to dramatically up Rui Hachimura's scoring and call it good, right? Like, this is a good, balanced supporting group around AD, but you take him out of there and things start falling apart pretty quickly. And it was a JJ decision, which I think we've all been clamoring for. He made AD that priority on offense. He made him the number one option. And like we said, the first three games, everyone's saying, what a genius situation. But without AD, it... It isn't as good, obviously, because yeah. you need the main cog in the machine. Uh, the Clippers, on the other hand, they're at the Intuit Dome. They got the wall. They got rave reviews from guys like KD and Booker. Uh, they got Amir Coffee, which is, uh, if you've Hell been yeah, watching lately, that's a big piece for this team. Um, what what are the positives and like what can the Clippers do to kind of stay in the mix of that play-in scenario? 
Yeah, so the positives, they play really hard. Their defense is pretty good overall. Mm -hmm. They just have exactly the kind of roster that you would expect them to have, which is James Harden is doing a ton all the time, but is really the only on that guy on that team who can make a pass for somebody else, who can really create a play for somebody else. Everyone else is doing the best with what they've got. They're cutters. They're more defense first players. They're they're role guys by definition. In Norm Powell's case, a great individual scorer, a great shooter. Yep. But ultimately, in terms of what's going to lead to really high level NBA offense, it's just not there. And yeah. so they're fighting and competing with some of these other teams, but they just don't have the firepower. And guess what? They're missing Kawhi Leonard and might be for the foreseeable future. So there's a, a definitive Kawhi shaped hole in, in the rest of this roster right now. I do like that they have like diet James Harden, like right behind him and Kevin Porter Jr. It's like, and when they're both wow. on the court together, I mean, like, you know what I mean? As far as the movements of what they're yes. doing out there, it looks like a two for one Spider Man meme. It's like your turn, my turn that can happen. And so the Clippers are just fascinating to watch in general and against the Spurs the other night that incredible comeback Zubots has been a part of the all five all top five uh, largest comebacks in Clippers history and apparently they're all from 2019 to 2024 <laughs> so there's a nice little tidbit for you that uh, the Clippers are, are making crazy things happen one more thing before we go to break uh, no pop on the sidelines obviously some health issues it was it was weird to see a Spurs game without pop how much of yeah. a storyline is that going to end up becoming for this team because it was nice to see Chris Paul Wimby pop like it looked like it was moving in the right direction i mean we hope it won't be one right? right we hope that pop will get healthy and back on the sidelines or at least at least back into good shape in relatively short order incredibly scary moment for one of you know by for my money the best coach in nba history but the mm -hmm. entire nba world is, is kind of waiting with bated breath right now to see what's going on with pop and how he's feeling and what he's up to but it's a huge deal for the spurs you know developmentally in terms of the coaching in these games but also he is as close to a pillar of that organization as anyone can be for a major sporting franchise. So we, we're wishing Pop the best. We're hoping he's back out there soon. Yeah, major pillar in all of basketball. And like you said, totally. we're, we're hoping that he uh, is better soon. We're going to take a quick break. and When we come back, we're going to talk some Eastern Conference NBA basketball. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Through the Ringer. We're here with Rob Mahoney, and we are talking NBA basketball. We kind of ran through the Western Conference, at least the biggest storylines. There's so much uh, minutia in the NBA storyline scene, and Godspeed to you, Rob. You do a lot of work uh, put, piecing this all together for us, but <laughs> I want to talk about Philadelphia, which is quite the puzzle. Uh, they are still trying to piece this whole thing together. There's been drama, to say the least, coming out of the gates, but they do have Maxi, which is fun to pull for. They did have Paul George back the other night, um, you know, which is an encouraging sign Joel and B should be back soon uh your thoughts on Philly so far and like can they get this all together yeah they're just not capable of having a normal season <laughs> no and I, I think you know Joel's tenure in particular there's always been something sometimes it's Ben Simmons related sometimes it's James Harden related sometimes mm. it's Joel related or, or at least related to his injuries in this case sometimes it's just the whole roster has been turned over around him and so I was really hoping this would be a somewhat normal sixer season doesn't seem to be in the cards. We have pushes in the locker room with media members. We have a really slow start, understandably, with one of the best players in the world sidelined, in addition to Paul George. Ultimately, I think they're going to be okay once everybody gets back out there. But how much are those guys going to be out there is sort of the defining question of their season. How many games can Joel actually play? Not just will he be healthy, but when will he be healthy in the stages of the season? Like, will he be healthy by the end is sort of the question we always end up asking. Which leads me right to my next question, which is about the Celtics. Is there anybody that can actually challenge the Celtics in the East? I mean, Goldsberry just put out a tweet talking about how many made threes they already have this season. <laughs> it's already more than the 86 Celtics had in their entire season. And obviously, we are not even close to this season wrapping up we just started um the context of this team they're going for back to back they obviously are supremely gifted as an offensive group they play great defense like what are what are the chances that someone can come in there and actually disrupt this team i think the the closest answers would be a fully healthy version of the sixers would mm. at least be a stylistic difference that could make things interesting although i don't necessarily see it maybe the team the only team in the east that's currently above them in the standings the cleveland cavaliers I could see them having a better regular season record than the Celtics. As we saw in the playoffs, it's just kind of a tough matchup for them. And I think something would have to shift. In particular, something would have to go wrong for Boston. Boston might have to lose to somebody else for the, for the Cavs to go all the way. Or just like maybe Chris Epps Porzingis comes back and is never fully healthy. Maybe they don't have the fullest version of their team. Because if that's the case, if there's any compromise in what the Celtics are doing, 
the Cavs are proving to be the kind of opponent that can really give you a run for your money. Like they, they have cleaned up so much of what they were doing offensively and in their rotation. I mean, they look like out and out one of the best teams in the league right now. And let's talk about the Cavaliers because they do have probably just talking about matchups. When you look at the center position of the Cavaliers, having Jared Allen and then having Mobley with the second yeah. unit as a center going up against Al Horford and Kristaps Porzingis, right? That would be the matchup when you talk about that series and where they would particularly have an advantage. What is like the Cleveland Cavaliers ceiling as a regular season team? Because Donovan Mitchell, in, by all accounts, should be in the MVP conversation and Evan Mobley should be maybe in that Chet Wimby conversation, right? As one of those guys. Absolutely. I mean, I think their regular season ceiling is they could have the best record in the league, right? Mm. They, they've shown that year over year, they're going to be a really good defense, that the bones of that were already in place. Then you bring in Kenny Atkinson as the new head coach of this team. The rotation makes a lot more sense. Evan Mobley has been empowered. Darius Garland is back and healthy. It turns out when your jaw isn't wired shut, you might feel a little better and play <laughs> right. a little better. He's been he's been phenomenal for them so far. But overall, I just think the ball movement is so much more crisp, right? Like what they're trying to accomplish offensively it's just it's a completely different pace of play than we're used to seeing from the Cavaliers. And you can see that with Mobley in particular, the sort of grab and go stuff where he's not the timid big who can't quite finish inside anymore. He's, you know, a Giannis Jr. running the open floor, stretching by people. That's a totally different kind of force and one that, frankly, could be a lot more imposing to a team like the Celtics. Yeah, he went from developing to develop to real quick. Yes. And it is fun to watch. One last thing before we let you go. Are, are is there any sort of path for the Bucks to make uh, a move? You know what I mean? Whether it be like a, oh. a trade or is it, you know, they just get everybody healthy and they turn things around. Like, where do we sit right now? Because this is uh, not good for Dame or for Giannis. Yeah, they have to make some kind of move. They just don't have enough good NBA players right now. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is when Chris Middleton is out, that's what the rotation is going to look like. But even if you put Middleton back in there, they just don't have the kind of depth that you actually need to compete to the point that Giannis and Dame are having 30 point games and they lose. And that's, that's, when, a, that's when you knew it was a problem, right? When both those guys play good and completely. you lose. Completely. It's an unacceptable outcome. Mm -hmm. And the, the trick with that, not only do they not have a lot of readily accessible players who are all that tradable or all that attractive to other teams, like maybe you can flip Brooke Lopez into something, the kind of rim protector who could help another team. Maybe you could trade Middleton for something. Maybe you could even trade Dame if you really wanted to do something extreme. But the Bucks are also over the second apron, and so every trade they make is harder and more complicated, and they can't even like aggregate players together to make a deal. Everything has to be basically one for one. Uh, very hard for them to actually improve their roster at this juncture, which is not what you want to hear when you're Giannis and you're putting up 35 and losing, but this is where they find themselves. Yeah, and if there's anybody that could actually turn a season around, it would be Giannis. I mean, he still leads the league in field goals made per game. He's like around 12. There's really no one over double-digit field goal made. Yeah a game that's just what he does uh but yeah this is a really dark start uh from for the milwaukee bucks uh rob where can we find all your work and then we'll let you go enjoy the rest of your day man always at the ringer.com always at the ringer nba show come come check us out see what we're up to we'll we'll be with you all season long yeah they are locked in over there on group chat rob we appreciate you coming on the show man we'll have you back soon thanks so much so, sounds good it for another edition of Through the Ringer. Thanks to Cousin Sal as always and we appreciate Rob Mahoney getting us up to speed on all things NBA. We appreciate you watching us at home there and we will be back next week here on Through the Ringer. We'll see you then.